brains. Brains. Nom, 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 nom. Next up in my Amicus Anthology Horror Review series is Asylum. Now, Asylum was released in 1972 and it was a big year for Amicus because it was the first year where they released two anthology horror films almost side by side. The other film would be Tales from the Crypt based on the EC comics from the 1950s. Asylum was directed by Roy Ward Baker, who you may know as the director of films like Scars of Dracula and Quatermass in the Pit. So he was well known to people through his work with Hammer Studios, Amicus's uh, contemporaries. The cinematographer was Dennis Coop, who was uh, involved in the effects work for Superman and Superman 2. And the film was once again written by Robert Block. In this instance, Robert Block's writing uh, came in the form of short stories that he himself had already written, and he developed them and adapted them for the big screen. Now this would be the last of a trilogy of films that Robert Block did for Amicus under the anthology horror genre. The first being Torture Garden, the second being The House That Drip Blood and the third being this film Asylum. Released in America as House of the Crazies, Asylum is one of the most notable anthology horror films ever made. It's one of the anthology horror films that many fans hold up as a prime example of the genre at its best, with a wraparound story that works naturally and flows naturally while containing the other stories within the film brilliantly. For those who haven't watched any of my earlier videos, or for those who aren't aware what anthology horror is, it's a subgenre of horror whereby you have a main story, such as in the film Creep Show, where it's a comic book that a child is reading, and we get to see the other stories played out, linked together by that main story. So in Creep Show, it's the child reads the uh, stories, and we get to see those stories from the comic book. So in Asylum, we have Robert Powell, the actor playing a psychiatrist, who is visiting an insane, asy an insane asylum, if I can even say it, going for a job interview to try and work there. Now, he is greeted by Dr Rutherford, who is the head psychiatrist of the institute. It's this sort of big, yeah, really imposing sort of gothic building. And Dr Rutherford questions uh, Robert Pill's character's uh, experience and what he thinks of institutes like the asylum. It turns out that Robert Powell's character doesn't actually agree with asylums. Um, he feels that they isolate people too much, but he feels that through working there he can actually do some good. Now Dr Rutherford sets the psychiatrist a test, and that test is that he has to go upstairs to one of the secure wards, one of the most dangerous wards where they have the, the most insane uh, prisoners there. And these inmates all have their own stories to tell. Now, the psychiatrist is greeted by a, a sort of an orderly that works in the hospital and he takes him from room to room. Now, the, the test that Dr. Rutherford sets out for him is that he has to guess which one of those inmates was actually a previous employee of the asylum. So one of the people that he's interviewing actually was at some point a doctor working there and has since went mad and if he can identify that person without obviously just asking them then uh, Dr Rutherford will deem him uh, knowledgeable enough to actually work in the asylum. The first story that the psychiatrist is told is uh, given to him by a female inmate who sits sort of shying away from him within this you know asylum cell. The story she tells is about her plot with a, with a man to kill the man's wife. So she was a mistress and the husband wanted to off the, the wife because they would then get the money because she's actually a really wealthy, wealthy heiress. Now we then get to see the story play out and the story is that 
the husband plots to kill his wife and he waits for her to come home and when she comes home he you know he's very very nice to her and kind to her and we find out that she's actually interested in the occult and voodoo and, and, and such things and he is very nice to her and then asks her to come down to the cellar because he has something to show her and uh, not a clever thing to do so he takes her into the cellar and in the cellar there's a, a big a freezer unit there and she seems to be delighted with this, you know, bear in mind this is the 1970s. Uh, she seems to be delighted with this and, and says, oh, it's, it's wonderful. And, and then he says, I've got something else for you. And he turns around, she turns around and he kills her. He then disposes of the body inside the freezer. That's why he got it. And then goes to phone his mistress to tell that the deed has been done and to carry out the next phase of their plan. Something rather creepy then happens involving the body of the dead wife and the husband goes missing. When he goes missing the mistress goes to the house to try and find him and that's where the main part of the story takes place. While this story was adapted from a short story by Robert Block it is a prime example of something that you would see in the EC comics. Often they deal with themes of love and adultery and revenge and it really fits into the mould of, of these anthology horror films quite quite well. I think that the performances are good in the first story. I think the story itself is creepy. But I think the one problem with it is that the effects are a little bit hokey. They have dated a little bit. I think if it was done now... Actually, if it was done now, it wouldn't be done better. They'd probably try to, to use CG and it would fail miserably. But... Um, Perhaps if this had been done in the late 80s, uh, before CG came in, it may have, the, the effects used within this story may have really carried it off much better. But the, in saying that, it's still a really you know creepy for, uh, creepy little story. And like I say, it's, it's really typical of the sorts of stories that you would see in EC Comics. So it's a good entry into the anthology horror genre. Once the psychiatrist has heard the story, he then goes to the next cell, and in the next cell is a man who was once a tailor. He had his own tailor in business, he had his own shop. So he begins to tell his gruesome story to the psychiatrist and to let him know why he's ended up in the asylum. In his story, that again we see play out, he is a tailor who lives with his wife and his business isn't doing very well and he's obviously got a landlord and we see the landlord come in and the landlord basically says listen if you can't pay your rent then you are chucked out in like a couple of days so this is you know quite sad you know because the the tailor isn't a young man you know it's not like he can just go and start up again you know um he he would be in serious trouble if, if himself and his wife were, were thrown out into the street. So, luckily enough, when the landlord leaves the shop late at night, a man comes in, played by Peter Cushing, who has the air of a wealthy businessman. Now, he then asks the tailor if he could construct uh, an entire suit, and that this suit would have to be made from this special type of material. That type of material he provides and it has a strange sort of uh, glow-in-the-dark type effect you know to, to the cloth. It, it looks you know really peculiar. So Peter Cushing's character asks him and says right can, can you deliver this for a certain date for a few days time and uh, he said I'm willing to pay you a lot of money for it so the tailor is instantly thinking well brilliant you know all my problems have been solved now what the businessman then says is that the only thing is you must follow the instructions specifically when you're making this suit he doesn't want to get measured for the suit for himself he, it's a gift for his son and he gives the measurements to the tailor so the tailor can make the suit without the sun coming in to get measured so it doesn't ruin the surprise 
and he's provided with this book by Peter Cushing that tells him at what time he must work on the suit and most of the time this is you know late at night and it's the only time he must do it and if he doesn't follow the rules to the letter Peter Cushing's character will know and uh, he'll not get paid so the businessman of uh, the tailor rather sorry you know doesn't want to mess it up so he he really wants to follow those instructions to the letter to make sure he gets the money so that he can pay his landlord um, now obviously there's something much more sinister going on but I don't want to ruin the rest of the story for anyone that hasn't seen the film with the second story we have Peter Cushing who is the the link which chains all of the Amicus films together he's in every single one of them apart from the sort of unofficial Amicus film Monster Club now Peter Cushing's character in, in this uh, in this story is one that is quite sinister, quite creepy and you know Peter Cushing as always just plays it absolutely perfectly um, as does you know everyone else in this film, the, the actors are, are all uh, really really great I think the, the main thing with the second one is that it has a little bit of heart to it, it has a little bit of poignancy which is again something that you see with the Peter Cushing stories in the anthology films a lot of the time they get uh, they get him to play a real human character, a character that isn't so simple, you know, a character that is quite complex and again we get to see that here where this character uh, of the businessman evokes like sort of quite a range of different emotions from the audience at different points in the story. Um, again, some people have complained about the effects in this. The effects are the luminous suit that I've already talked about is obviously very sort of 1970s but I think that the the creepiness of this, the payoff of, of this story compared to the first one is, is better um, but you know it, it's, a, it's a very good entry in the, the anthology horror series. While Asylum is a, a, a really great film I think that the third story in Asylum is one of the weaker entries in any anthology horror film. It's not that it's particularly badly made, it's just that it it's very very predictable. Now the story, uh, as much as there is one, is about a girl who was once uh, an inmate at an asylum, or a patient in the asylum. You don't know if it's uh, I can't remember if it's criminally or, or, or just uh, whether she's she's uh, been put there for her own mental health issues. But this girl has been brought out of an asylum and she's been brought to this house and she's sort of leaving a sort of boring existence. And then her friend comes to visit her. And when her friend comes to visit her, sort of bad things start happening. Now, that's really as much as I can talk about the, the, the story. It's really obvious what the payoff is to the story. It's quite unoriginal as well. I think we've seen it in other anthology horror films, a similar sort of idea. Um, there's really not a great deal to talk about with this one. I think that uh, it is the, the weakest part of the film. Once the psychiatrist has heard the third story, he then moves on to the fourth final cell. Now in this cell is Herbert Lom who is a wonderful actor, he's, he's one of my favourites. You will, you'll have seen him in things like The Pink Panthers, Inspector Dreyfus, and The Lady Kills, the original version. Now, Herbert Lom's character is obviously a technically gifted man, and he has created these, <coughs> excuse me, he's created these small dolls in his room, and they all resemble people in real life. And... Robert Powell's character, the psychiatrist, admires them, you know, says, you know, this is fantastic work. And Herbert Lom says, yeah, but this one's the most special. So he shows him this doll, and it's Herbert Lom's face on the doll. And he said, in this doll is the 
perfect workings of a human being, perfect heart, perfect liver, everything. And inside the head is a perfect brain. And Herbert Lom says that that he's had a, an altercation with Rutherford, the, the man who runs the asylum, because he's going to take them away, he's going to take the dollars away. And Herbert Lom says that, well, look, I, I'm going to make him pay for this. I've figured out a way to actually transfer my thought into this doll, and the doll will have my consciousness in it. There'll be a connection between the two of us. So, what's strange about the fourth story is that the fourth story then spills out directly into the wraparound. We don't actually see why Herbert Lom's character was taken to the asylum or put there. We see the rest of the story play out within the asylum, and it directly segues into the conclusion of the movie. It's a good story, you kind of wonder how he ended up there, there's a little bit of mystery that way and it's a nice little change from a lot of anthology films because the antho that this story is inextricably linked into the the film. The other the other stories you could watch is standalone short films but this one you can, it's, it's part of the wraparound and it's its own standalone story. So it's quite clever that way in, in terms of the genre. So that's the wrap around and the stories with a little review sort of put in for, for each part of the film. I think in general Asylum is a really strong anthology horror film and it is a strong entry in the Amicus series. For some people it is the best of the films. Just like I said, some people argue that The House of Drip Blood is the best. Um, but I think that while I do really enjoy Asylum, I think it's a really good watch, I just didn't find the stories as compelling as some of the other stories in, in some of the other Amicus films. Um, and I think that is the main reason why I would say I would put some of the Amicus films before this one. But nonetheless, it's still a really, really good entry in the series, it's a really good anthology horror film. So. I would definitely recommend see it, seeing it, and, it and it does have one of the best wraparounds, it does feel like the wraparound is naturally there and the stories aren't just shoehorned in, they are all part of the wraparound. Some anthology horror films really suffer from that where you think, you know, this story doesn't mix well with the, with the wraparound and it's quite interesting when you think that all the stories started off as individual short stories by Robert Block and he's put them together, you know, really beautifully. So I, I would definitely recommend it and go and check it out. But now I'm going to go on to the spoiler section of this video. So if you haven't watched Asylum, switch off now and then go and watch it and then come back and watch this part of the video. Okay, so major spoilers. Starting with the first story within the wraparound. We'll get to the wraparound at the, at the end after this. The first story where the husband and his mistress kill the wife, um, I think uh, the, the obviously the whole, the whole thing is that the, they chop up her body, or well, the husband chops up her body and then he puts them in the, the freezer and then he's horrified because he's talking to his mistress, he turns around, you know, he's talked to his mistress on the phone and he turns around and he sees the head roll out as if it's moving around on its own and it's it's uh he's, he's covered everything in this sort of brown paper he's wrapped it wrapped all the body parts up so the story then plays out he you know he sort of screams goes missing and then the um the mistress arrives and she's then attacked by all the different body parts and like i said before i think it works i think it is creepy i think it is the most easy you know and within this film, it's the, it's the story that I could totally have seen within a, within a comic book, within an anthology horror comic book. Uh, but I do think the effects, especially like some of the effects of like the, the hand moving and all that, it, it was very robotic, you know, and I think it suffers slightly from that, it's aged slightly um, because of that. Whereas I think the sort of animatronics that they have now, if they, if they used them, it, it could have been even more effective. But it's still a chilling, chilling, you know, instalment within the Amicus series, uh, you know, and, and I think that the the themes of the husband and the mistress 
getting their comeuppance. Uh, again, totally EC Comics all the way. You know, there is a moral to the tale. You know, these bad people will get what's coming to them. When we talk about the second story with the tailor, um, I like the twist where you find out when when I think it's very creepy when the tailor goes to the businessman's house to to deliver the suit and then ask for payment, and he sees that all this sort of occultish uh, paraphernalia has been set up all over the place, and then he sees that uh, the man's son is actually dead and he's you know lying in a coffin. I think that whole scene is really creepy. You know, it's like. A, you know, you hear stories about that, people like walking into someone's house and just being presented with something where you're like, what the hell have I walked into? And I think that moment really plays out well at that. I think the uh, the the whole thing with the tailor not, you know, getting desperate because he's not being paid because uh, Peter Cushing's character claims that, you know, he'll get the money eventually because this will be a huge breakthrough that, that he's... The, that he's discovered because the idea is that this suit when he puts it on his son in a certain way at a certain time his son will be reanimated um, I think that's really well done obviously you know Peter Cushing's uh, character gets killed in a struggle and then he the tailor comes back to the shop and unbeknownst to him his wife finds the suit and she puts the suit on one of the mannequins in the shop and the mannequin comes to life and I think that's a really creepy creepy idea you know I mean if you've ever walked through a sort of uh, a shop where they've got loads of mannequins it can be quite a creepy thing you know uh, at least I, th I think you know it's like walking through walking through a waxworks museum you know it's, it's it's like the uncanny valley, it's like something that's almost human but not quite and you expect them at some point just to move, you know, and I think that's a creepy thing, especially in waxworks museums um, and statues, sometimes you get statues in graveyards and things like that, that are like that. Um, so I think when, this, when the mannequin comes to life that is really creepy. Yes, it is a bit 70s, you know, big luminous suit and, you know, the big tash you know, the guy's got, and it's, it, it does sort of feel a little bit dated that way, but the thing that I couldn't understand with this one is that I couldn't really entirely understand why the tailor was in the asylum as much, unless he'd got rumbled for the murder, I don't know. I mean, I'm assuming he did because he must have, you know, because obviously he's telling the story. Um, and... Uh, did he murder Peter Cushing's character? He did, didn't he? By accident. I'm sure he did. Um, so, but, it's, but I think the whole thing where he's sort of saying, you know, look, he's still out there, he's still out there. I think if they'd made the mannequin even more... even more sort of foreboding and intimidating, then I think, you know, you could understand why he's saying he's still out there and, you know, might hurt someone. But all in all, I, I like the second story. I think it's good, I think it's strong. Um, and it's it's always nice in an anthology horror film to have two good stories back to back. With regards to the third story, again, I don't have much to say. You know, the fact that the that it turns out that the imaginary friend is her, it's in her head. You know, that's not really a big surprise, and you can kind of see how all oh, it's sort of going to go there. And um, you know, the, the story very much telegraphs what's happening. Um, it's annoying me because there's an, another anthology horror film where it's pretty much exactly the same story. I think it's maybe Trilogy of Terror. It is Trilogy of Terror. Uh, there's a very, very similar story in it, but I think that well, this film came before then. Uh, but, you know, we have seen it uh, in, in other anthology horror films. It's just, it's I just think it's quite a bland story really, so there's not really much else I can say about it than that. I think we can see the genius of Robert Block in this film with the fourth story, the the story about Herbert Lom's character creating the doll where he's going to put his consciousness into it. And the reason for that is that, like I said before, it goes into the wraparound and then it leads to the conclusion of the film. And um, that's really interesting because we were led into thinking that we're going to see this his story play out, and we don't really. Um, 
yes, there can be a little bit of the feeling that, you know, well, there could have been more Herbert Lom in it, you know, he doesn't have much to do in this film, but when he's there, he's there, you know, he's a real presence on screen. And uh, I think the problem is that when the doll animates and it's walking around, it really does tread that thin line between creepy and just laughable. So I think some people will find it creepy and then other people will look at it and just laugh because it looks silly. So I think that's one of the one of the problems with it. I don't know, I'm not really a big fan of the idea. They've all got these sort of metallic, you know, uh, bodies. And I think some of the shots with the, the doll walking around, the camera lingers too much on it. Absolutely lingers too long on it. I mean, there's one bit where it's just walking for ages like this. You know, and it's, it's quite funny. That being said, I think uh, when he goes into Dr. Rutherford's office, the doll does, and, and Robert Powell confronts Dr. Rutherford and says that he thinks the asylum's a despicable place, and then the doll kills Dr. Rutherford. I think uh, that is well done, and, and it is really creepy when Robert Powell's character stands on the on the doll and you see all of its insides, all the blood to come out of it and all that. I think it's quite, quite horrific. Um, and you know, Doctor Rutherford's dead. I think it's really clever the way that that's actually at that point, that's almost ended the wraparound right there and Herbert Lom's story at the same time. You know, because he runs upstairs, finds out that Herbert Lom has died from the from the orderly who was taking him around the asylum wards, and then of course there's the uh, other twist, you know, to the film. And honestly, if you are watching this and you haven't watched the film, turn off now. Um, but the orderly is the doctor who had went mad and he'd actually killed the orderly and taken his place. So, um, and then again, the film ends with, you know, Robert Pill's character getting killed and then the film ends with uh, the orderly um, Played by what's his name, Jeffrey Baylord, Baylord, Jeffrey something. And I should know his name because he's actually in a few of the Amicus films. Um, he was a shopkeeper in the House of Drip Blood, and he is the tour guide in Tales from the Crypt. Um, he he sort of talks to the camera again at the end of the film. Again, we get that at the end of Torture Garden. We get that at the end of Tales from the Crypt. We get that at the end of The Vault of Horror. We get that at the end of Beyond the Grave. And at the end of the first film, Dr. Terror's House of Horror, we don't get him talking to the camera so much, but there's a right close-up, you know, really, really tight close-up, where he says, have you not guessed who I am? And, and, and it, you know, it's so close and in his face that it's almost as if he's talking to the audience and not the men in the carriage. So that's a sort of running theme in the amicus films. Um, I think that the the one of the, the, the most impressive things is how brutal the murder of Robert Powell's character is. I mean it's really brutal. Some people don't like the m maniacal screaming by the orderly once he's done it, when he's listened to it, but I, I quite like that. It really it reminded me of the Joker actually in Arkham Asylum. That's kind of what came to mind when I watched uh, that part of the film because that's really the way he sort of comes across. Um, what I always wondered was what was he going to do? Was he, did he did he like Robert Powell's character and was he going to let him go? Because he really he tries to stop Robert Powell from going in the room to find the body of the orderly and then figuring out that you know this guy's not who he said he said he was. And then once he does, he sort of changes tack, decides to kill him. But if he didn't want him to go in and find out, maybe he wanted to let him go because he liked him. Or maybe he wanted him to go because he wanted his old job back and he was just pretending to be this other guy. So, um, yeah, the the film, all in all, Asylum, very good anthology horror film. I disagree with the people that say that it's the best of the Amicus films. I don't think it is. I think From Beyond the Grave is better. I think Dr. Terrence House of Horror, the Horrors is better. Um, I think it's got a better wraparound than most of the others, but as a complete film, 
I, I just the stories is very well executed, but the stories just didn't hold my interest. So I definitely check it out. Up next, we have Tales from the Crypt, which was released uh, in the same year. And what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to start doing a, a another review series concurrently with the Amicus ones because we've still got another four films to do and I'm probably going to do that from now on because if I do a t if I do a review series with like eight, eight, there's eight films in it if you if there's some of you guys out there who don't like those films and don't want to hear about them then you've got to wait eight videos before you get something that's worth watching on my channel so what I'll do is I'll alternate them so I'm going to start a double bill uh, there's going to be a, a two part or uh, Asian horror review with Uzumaki and uh, I Saw the Devil so I'll do Uzumaki and then I'll do Tales from the Crypt from Amicus then I'll do I Saw the Devil both recommended by MonkeyTube and then I'll do Vault of Horror and then I'm going to do a double bill of zombie films so there'll be Return of the Living Dead next then uh, it'll be From Beyond the Grave then it will be um, Pontypool, which finishes off the zombie double bill. And then finally, Monster Club. A bit confusing, but just two review series running concurrently. That's all I really should have said. And there'll be other videos in between all of them anyway. Uh, so anyway, thanks for watching this far. And uh, on to Tales from the Crypt.